Good morning, brothers and sisters. As we come to our final meeting this week, and we open again this chapter in the book of Judges, shall we ask our Heavenly Father to open our minds so that we might more clearly understand the symbols that are before us and how they relate to that which we are seeing today. Shall we pray? Gracious Father in heaven, we thank you for this opportunity that we have to gather again together. We ask, Father, for your blessing and for your guidance. As we open your word, as we apply ourselves to come to understand the symbols in this example of Samson. Father, we can only do this through the guidance of your spirit. We pray for your spirit. We also ask, Father, for your angels to attend us. We thank you for the promises that you are giving us. We seek, Father, that we may learn more so that your character may be glorified. I thank you for those that are joining with us in this session and for those that will view this later with the internet. Please bless the efforts to have this placed on the internet. Guide us now, be with us each one. For this we thank you, for this we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay. In a brief recap, when we we're looking at this situation, here is Samson. We began addressing that it came to pass afterwards that he loved a woman in the valley of Sorek, whose name was Delilah. We were establishing that this valley of Sorek was near the border of the Philistines and of Israel. And it says here, and the lords of the Philistines came up unto her and said unto her, entice him and see whether his great strength lieth and by what means we may prevail against him, that we may bind him to afflict him, and we will give the every one of us 1,100 pieces of silver. Did we establish the symbol of the 1,100 pieces of silver and their meaning? Are we comfortable with what we addressed yesterday? Or are there yet questions? Okay, so, well, for 11, um, Stephen, did you have any ideas about 11? What's that? No? No, I haven't. Okay. I mean, because we connected it to um, uh, you know the number of the disciples who are left and things like that, but but the other thing is, we do have Daniel chapter eleven, and especially eleven eleven. Um, could we connect it to that? doesn't seem very strong connection okay now we do have the 1100 in uh chap the next chapter as well 1100 pieces of silver so we have this doubled and we know that 22 
is 11 plus 11. That is 11 generations to the flood and 11 generations to entering into Egypt. Um, uh, we have the 22 years in the story of Joseph divided as 11 and 11. So can we take that there's a connection between this 11 at the end of the story of the judges and the 11 at the beginning of the story of the judges, the 1100? Yeah, well, when I originally did this here, I thought the chronology of chapter 17 was after chapter 16. And uh, that was my connection. You have this here, 1100 uh, shekels or pieces of silver being given to a woman. And then yeah. we have a woman there in Judges 17 having 1100 pieces of, sh of silver. Yeah. So I was thinking that this is, uh, that, that woman in Judges 17 was uh, Delilah. That's my oh. initial thinking. But, okay. but of course, we know that's not the case. No. But we can look at this 1100 um, as a symbol that sort of bookends um, the story of the judges, even though chapter 17 follows it, it's really at the beginning of the story of the judges. So, so to me, the two 11s would represent the 22. Um, and any other thoughts on that? Well, the 11 that we find in chapter 17 would be a separation from God because it's 11 that is being used for idolatrous purposes. Here again, the 11 is being used for idolatrous purposes. Mm -hmm. Why would this be important for us? Is this not a warning to us to avoid idolatry in all forms? Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, but we know that this 1100 is a symbol that relates to our time. And, and we haven't really figured out exactly what Delilah represents. I mean, the thing that's interesting about her name in Hebrew is it's the, the Strong's number 1807, which gives us July 18th. And the meaning of the name is? Well, it means feeble. Well, okay. Now we're, we're going to come to a point here in today's study where Mrs. White has a very different meaning than feeble. Okay. So. So she has some definition of the word Delilah? Of the name Delilah, yes. Okay. Now, what are we seeing in this situation with Delilah? Where is Samson's downfall coming? Where is his downfall in this 20 year period? <clears throat> At the end. Okay, what I'm what I'm trying to get at. Samson gave rein to his passions where it concerned the woman that he wanted as a wife. Right? Then, yeah. then he gave rein to his passions his unbridled passions where it came to the harlot of Gaza. 
Now we have this situation in the Valley of Sorek with Delilah. Now, Samson is being pressed because here is Delilah. Does Delilah love Samson? Simple question. Does she love Samson? No. What does she love? Money. Right. Is that not another form of idolatry? Is yep. this not a woman that loves money? Mm -hmm. Is this not a church that loves money as a symbol? Yeah. Is this not yeah, the mainstream? Sorry, Dwight. The mainstream has gone for a church, uh, state accreditation and all the grants and funds that they get from that. My, my, my bigger question, because we have this as an example of what has gone before and then with what's going on now, is in 1888, the church loved money more than they loved the message. Are we repeating that same problem today? What was the biggest issue that came up after July 18th? The biggest issue where? Within the movement especially within the movement as it pertained to future for America. Maybe this is an unfair question for you. Mm -hmm. uh, interesting that the sum of the divisors of 1100, as Stephen noted there, is 2604. Right. Agreed. Back to my question, though. Yeah. The issue that was raised by Bronwyn was very specific. With the message of July 18th, the money that had been flowing to Future for America was greatly reduced. With the, with the promotion of it or the failure? Yes, with so the, the promotion and then the failure. Okay. So, so it became about money. Correct. Hmm. Now, Delilah said to Samson, tell me, I pray thee, wherein thy great strength lieth, and wherewith thou mightest be bound to afflict thee. This woman has no shame. I want to know the source of your strength. I want to know how you can be afflicted like anyone else. <clears throat> Samson gave in to this type of not concern, but gave in to to this type of a request because he saw something in Delilah that we obviously don't see. Now we go through this, bind me with seven new cords. There were men lying in wait. The Philistines are upon thee, and he breaks the cords as if, as if they were touched by fire. Then Delilah says, Behold, thou hast mocked me and told me lies. Now tell me, wherewith thou mightest be bound? She repeats herself. 
if they bind me with new ropes, that wherewith work hath not been done, then I will be as any other man. They do the same thing. He broke those, those ropes as if they were just threads. Now for the third time. Is, is Samson a message here? Samson is definitely a message here. So they're binding up the message? They're trying to keep the message from going out. Yep. Okay. Now the third time. Delilah says to Samson. Before this, you have mocked me and told me lies. Tell me now how you might be bound. How can Samson not see that this was a trap? How could the church not see that the alternate methods of study that they applied to the Bible were a trap? How could we, <clears throat> within the movement, be better prepared than they? Now this third time, Samson said, if thou weavest the seven walks of my head with the web. How many of us in the past have ever considered that Samson's hair had been put into seven locks? This was of God. Do not these seven locks of his hair represent the seven times of Leviticus 26. Yeah, well, we would see that with the cords and we would see that with the locks of his head. Well, how do you see it with the cords when, when those are new ropes? Um, the, they're green. How, how do I see that it's it represents the seven times? Yes. Um, well, because there's seven of them. I mean, I don't know. My point is that the seven locks of his head <clears throat> are fairly close to home. Mm -hmm. He was not going to be bound with the cords or the ropes that man could make. But the seven locks of his head were his symbol. Mm -hmm. The symbol that he was set aside by God in God's service. Mm -hmm. The symbol of the seven times of Leviticus 26 is how we are set aside for God's service. Yeah, but these, these are counter messages. So you have three counter messages. One, which is based on the seven times. That is people who have accepted the seven times. You have another one of the ropes, which is line upon line. Okay. And then and you have a third one, which is a, a much more complex structure. That is the weaving uh, or a tapestry in which uh, the seven, seven locks of his head are woven into this uh, loom. And these are all things that are meant to attack the message. Okay. So these are, are, are like the message, but they, they, they are meant to counteract it. That, that's the way that I understand these uh, three tests.
so that these three tests are also seen as three messages as part of the message of Samson and the false message of Delilah. Yeah, I mean, there's something more here, but because because it's an ironic story, it's kind of difficult sometimes to sort through it. But in our movement, we have had different messages that have tried to overthrow the truth that God has been showing us. I mean, we had Parminder's understanding. We had um, um, other types of things that have been presented to the movement. So to, to try to define which ones these are, or whether this is a progression of the movement that has, um, I mean, the main thing is that whatever's happening here is trying to counteract the primary message that God wanted to give this movement. But it doesn't mean that it's complete error. There's truth mixed with it. There's symbols here that represent uh, parts of this message. Okay. Now there's a question that was asked in the chat. Do we see any kind of connection with the seven spirits of God or the seven stars of Revelation 3? My question... <clears throat> My question would be, how do you see this? I'm just asking because it's seven hair, seven locks of hair, seven stars, seven, seven, uh, I guess they represent the seven churches, seven spirits, whatever that means. I'm just unclear, like, what does the seven stand for? Okay. Just seeing if there's a commonality somewhere. Well, I'm looking at this <clears throat> in a little different way. Because with these three comments of Delilah, we have a false message of Revelation 14. We have new chords. Then we have rope, which I would, I would have to wonder if they are not representative of a false first and second angel's message. And then here, with his hair, the seven locks of his hair, if this is not a false third angel's message. Yeah. Well, see, I don't quite agree with the idea of false. So I understand what you're saying, but remember this is ironic. And these are tests brought to this movement. Okay. So, um, th th there, I would agree that somewhat there's a falseness to it. That is, it's a partial truth. But But they're necessary for this movement to get to where god wants to bring it um so i'm, I'm not quite I'm, I'm not quite sure yet exactly wh who de what delilah represents um but all of these things here are negative i mean samson himself is not a good symbol if, if we're going to look at it morally but he does represent christ so um delilah is a woman which usually represents a church but there's a test being brought to samson through this woman and um so going back to the name of delilah so ellen white says it means the consumer and that's that's really related to the definition of feeble or delicate um uh, so it's it's not really a different definition. It's just a different take on what that Hebrew word would mean. Um, 
But she, it, it's not often that Ellen White's going to just take a name in the Bible and give us the definition of it. Right? I'm not disagreeing. Yeah, so, so there must be significance here. Her name was Delilah the Consumer is what Ellen White says. Um, That's part you know, of what she says. Yeah. What's the other part that she says? Um, well, if you want me to read the paragraph, he did not again venture among the Philistines, but continued to seek those sensuous pleasures that were luring him to ruin. He loved a woman in the Valley of Sorek, not far from his birthplace. Her name was Delilah, the consumer. Sorek's vineyard also had a temptation for the wavering Nazareth. Okay. Yeah. From what are you reading? Uh, well, this is from Eternity Past. So, I mean, this is a condensation. Right. So, if we go back to the original document. Right. So, here it would be, patri well, there's it's in Patriarchs and Prophets. Um, what are you going to have as the original? Signs of the Times, 13th of October, 1881. Okay. So in that article, uh, you're going to have, well, it's all about Samson and Delilah. Yeah, he did not venture among the Philistines again, but continued to seek those sensuous pleasures that were luring him to ruin. He loved a woman in the Valley of Sorek, not far from his birthplace. Her name was Delilah, the consumer. Sorek's vineyards were also tempting to the wavering Nazarite who had already indulged in wine, thus breaking another tie that bound him. Must, what? I'm sorry. We must have very different versions of that article. Okay. Maybe I'm on the wrong place. No, you're, you're approximately the right place, but I mean the copy that – that I had found is very okay. different in the way that it, it reads. Okay, let me see again here. I'm just gonna look up the word consumer. See, okay. <clears throat> um, so we got patriarchs and prophets. Uh, Okay, right. it, does, it doesn't give me that reference when I search it. Because here again, there is a word that has been changed. Okay, what word's that? You're looking for consumer, and that's not the word that she uses in this article. Oh, okay, so there's another word. <clears throat> so, okay, I'll, I'll read this, and I'll send this copy up to you because it, I, I have it later in this this particular document for judges 16 but even this narrow escape did not serve to stay him in his evil course the third step downward soon followed the second <clears throat> he did not again venture into the country of the philistines but sought at home those sensual pleasures that were luring him on to ruin. He loved a woman in the Vale of Serek, not Sorek, but Serek. Her name was Delilah, which fitly signifies consuming or wasting. In the society of this enchantress, mm -hmm. the judge of Israel squandered precious hours <clears throat> that should have been devoted sacred that should have been sacredly devoted to the welfare of his people okay but the blinding passions which made the strongest weak had gained control of reason and of conscience the veil vale of serek a little valley not far from his own birthplace was celebrated for its vineyards these also had a temptation for the wavering nazarite who had already indulged in the use of wine, thus breaking another tie that bound him to temperance, to purity, and to God. 
Okay. I'm not sure what, I mean, obviously it's a little bit different wording, but it's the same meaning. Okay. Consuming or wasting. In other words, this is, it's almost like a cancer. This is something that yeah. is, mm -hmm. okay, it is putting his spiritual body in a condition that he was not being prepared to face the tests that he, he was to face. Yeah, I mean, we think of the word consumer differently, but you know what consumption is. Yeah. So that's the idea of wasting. So, yeah, we, we think of consumers, somebody who goes to the store and buys stuff. That's in the common vernacular now. Yeah, but but in the meaning of the word there that that they're translating it from the Hebrew, that consumer would be fine. I mean, it's just a, an old fashioned definition of it languishing feeble consuming wasting all those different words mean the same thing you're just uh trying to define that hebrew word okay comment from the chat consuming in joel 1 4 to 11. <clears throat> is this something that we should also examine? Well, this is the four generations. Right. Um, um, yeah, I don't know if it... Uh, It's not the same Hebrew that I can see, but um, I don't know if I would take these four generations and put that here with what's happening. Uh, is no, yeah, I don't think they relate. From the portion that we had just read, from what Sister White had written, mm -hmm. the third step downward closely followed the second. Mm -hmm. First, Samson selects a wife of the Philistines. Then Samson goes to the harlot of Gaza. Now he places himself with this woman, Delilah, because of his all consuming passion, where this passion is consuming even his reasoning as to what his mission was to be for his people. He placed himself above that which God would have him to do. Well, I mean, obviously the moral part of the story is important, but I don't know if that's what we want to look at in understanding it for our line. We have to be able to place all of it on the table. Well, yeah, except that it, it's it's ironic. I mean, this is Christ, so this isn't. Um, so when we're applying it as a type of Christ, um, you know, Christ wasn't evil, or you know, he didn't do anything wrong. So, so we know the moral lesson. We can see quite clearly what Samson has done wrong. But this is illustrating God's movement at the end of the world. You know, using a negative example to illustrate something positive. When Christ was confronted with the test in Gethsemane, what was his prayer? Well, you're talking about the unity 
for God's people. Let this cup pass from me. Oh, okay, that, yeah. Nevertheless, may thy will, not mine, be done. Whose will was Samson following? Well, Samson's following his own will. So, and this is, this is the warning for us today. I understand that. But Samson represents Christ. So we can focus on the moral part, and I'm not saying that that's wrong, but I want to understand it, how it illustrates this movement. Because we can't look at these negative things, if we're going to put it in our line, as, as errors or wrong things. They're representing something that was led of God. Samson here is, is representing Christ's love for the church. So, what message are we binding it, up? What's that? What message are we binding up? Well, that that's the whole point. If we have to understand what this, what these three uh, lines represent, or three messages. So we could say they're a false third angel's message, but I don't know if that's correct. I don't know if um, we can take the, the moral aspects of this and try to apply it to our lines. I think we just have to look at the symbols themselves. I mean, that's the way that I've been understanding it. I mean, maybe I'm wrong, but uh, I just see too much that represents this message. I mean, Delilah, her... Her name, as a number, represents July 18. So she can't be representing something bad. She must be representing something good. Even though in the moral aspect, it would be something bad. I was given a message. And it was, don't discard what God has given. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How are you applying that right now? Uh, I guess it would be a message. Okay. But as far as understanding um, this story of Delilah and Samson, um, we're, we're going to look at it morally. Samson is, is in error. Delilah is in error. But now it's represent, representing something that's about this movement where God has led this movement in a certain direction. And that direction is going to lead to uh, a victory but it's a very negative victory here it's samson's death but it's all the symbols here that need to be considered um you know just like the 1100 pieces of silver represent july 18th in that it's the 26th a uh, day of the fourth month so, so you just have all of these symbols. Um, I don't know. I don't know how fo focusing upon the moral aspects of it is going to help us understand um, the symbols, because the moral story is one thing, but the symbols are another. where we left off yesterday. And she said unto him, how canst thou say, I love thee, when thine heart is not with me? Thou hast mocked me these three times. 
and hast not told me wherein thy great strength lieth. He's being confronted symbolically and morally. <clears throat> How can you say, I love you, when your heart is not with me? Her heart was not with him either. <clears throat> Her heart was focused more upon the bribe that she was offered. She recognizes that three times he has not told her exactly what makes him different. And it came to pass when she pressed him daily with her words and urged him so that his soul was vexed unto death or shortened unto death. That he told her all his heart and said unto her, There hath not come a razor upon mine head, for I have been a Nazarite unto God from my mother's womb. If I be shaven, then my strength will go from me, and I shall become weak and be like any other man. Remove the seven locks from my head. Remove these seven braids. And I'm no different than anyone else. And when Delilah saw that he had told her all his heart, she sent and called for the lords of the Philistines, saying, Come up this once, for he has showed me all his heart. Then the lords of the Philistines came up unto her and brought money in their hand. Samson, the fourth time, then told her what it meant and what his being set aside meant in revealing that he was a Nazarite. Satan has ever achieved his greatest successes through the neglect of God's people to maintain their separation from the world from its customs, its practices, and its principles. There are but two great parties among men, the servants of Christ and the servants of Satan. Their leaders are opposites in every particular. Our Lord Jesus Christ, who came to conquer the prince of darkness, said, If ye were of the world, the world would love his own. But because you are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, Therefore, the world hateth you. Here, Christ makes a marked distinction between his followers and the world. Those who are of, are of the world are in direct opposition to those who love God and keep his commandments. The heart must be kept with all diligence, that the human be not exalted above the divine. If those who profess to love and serve God follow blind impulse rather than reason and conscience, they will fail by the artifice of Satan. The affections should be guarded and controlled lest they be placed upon unworthy subjects that are forbidden in the word of God. Samson had chosen to walk contrary to what God had already presented that should not be done. He is showing 
a type of Christ, but is he showing a type of Christ that we should follow? Well, okay, so so we know we have this moral story, and the moral story is teaching us something. But when it comes to the typology here, it's it's to be flipped on its head. But also we have all of these symbols, right? So for instance, the name Delilah, if you, um, um, you just multiply the letters of the name, right? So the gematria where instead of adding them, you multiply them. Okay. Get a number that's 207,360. Well, that number is 144 uh, times 144 times 10, right? So 20736 is one, 144 times 144 or 12 times 12 times 12 times 12, right? So that's that's her name, Delilah, right? So she has the symbols of um, the 144,000. But yet in the story, I mean, she's obviously not a very good person. She's just interested in money. So, um, so we have to figure out how we're going to relate to this moral aspect of the story and to the symbolic nature of the characters and the numbers and the names uh, that's unfolding here. Okay. <clears throat> Is there anything that we need to address regarding the Valley of Sorek, or as Mrs. White wrote it, Serek? What does the name of this valley mean? Means a vine. Is that Sorek? The church is compared to a vineyard. Right, but is that is that S-O-R-E-K or as Mrs. White would write it, S-E-R-E-K? Um, uh, S-O-R-E-K. Okay. Why why would it matter here? To a different That's what I'm time? asking. Yeah, I don't I don't think it would uh, just a different uh, transliteration of the Hebrew word. So the valley is named as the vine. And as Mrs. White had written, that here is, here is Samson. He has given. I, I have a, uh, it's not just a vine here, but what I had, it says a hissing, a coloring, inclining to yellow, a fruitless tree. Is Where that the one? That? Sorek? Really? Okay. Yeah. I don't know. I just look, Googled it. <laughs> okay. Here is Samson. We are called to be temperate in all things. Agreed morally, Samson was not temperate. He has now revealed the source of his strength, which is in the symbol of him being a Nazarite. But he set aside that vow in spending his time amongst the Philistines. And according to Mrs. White, spending time in drinking the wine.
So if he is drinking the wine, is he not accepting other doctrine? Doctrine that he should not be uh, accepting. If he is choosing that not to guard his affections, how can he be a watchman on the wall when he's giving rein to those affections? He's letting those affections control him. Uh, an another thing about this uh, number, the name of Delilah, Raphia adds up to 20,736. So that's one-tenth of the product of the name Delilah. So would we then see Delilah as our Raphia? Well, I, see, I think that Delilah, what she's doing in testing the message is really it's the testing of this message in the various predictions that are made i mean maybe we could take um these three and they could represent november 9th july 18th and december 25th or or maybe some other events but i mean we have the moral aspects of the story which we can see that delilah's negative but as far as a symbol it is actually a test that's being given to this movement. Okay, now as a symbol, mm -hmm. is Delilah of the nation of Israel or is she a Philistine? Well, she's a Philistine. How do you know this? Well, I mean, it's, it's assumed, I guess. I mean, I've never... I mean, it is possible that she's of the nation of Israel, I guess. I never thought about it. I just always assumed she was a Philistine. But it is on the border. Yeah. Because she's in, 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 in Palestine, I figured she's an Israelite. Well, she's on the border. This, this area is on the border, isn't it? Okay. We're Our new area. That, what so we could she be like those in the church who are who are dabbling with the world or are so worldly minded? Well, but but the thing is, we can't look at when we're dealing with the symbol. We can't look at the negative moral aspects and apply it. We have to apply these symbols are symbols within this movement itself of of the prophetic periods or the prophetic symbols that we have been using in predicting July eighteenth. I mean, so her name is 1870 or 1807 in Hebrew on, on the Strong's numbers. So we, we take that as a symbol of July 18th. Her name, when multiplied together, comes up to this number that's 144 times 144 times 10. And we already had 144 times 144 as being a symbol of raphia because that that's the, the name Rafi in English, where you multiply the letters together and you get 20736. So, um, so uh, yeah, the question is whether she's an Israelite or not. I mean, I always just assumed she wasn't, but I, I never actually asked that question to myself before because she is on the border and, and it could be that she's an Israelite, but... Uh, the Philistines are offering her money to betray Samson. So that I don't know. But we still can't get confused between the moral aspects of the story and what she would symbolize. I have, she, okay, I'm not approaching this from a moral standpoint whatsoever. Okay, I know. But when we're going through the story, we're talking about what her character is like and, and all these different things. Now, I'm, And that lesson, of course, is a warning to this movement. Right. So we can we can take this, the moral aspects, you know, the money aspects, the greed, all of those things on the surface are telling us one thing about this story. But when we look at the symbols that are here, 
these are the symbols of Christ coming to this earth to save mankind, and also symbols of this movement in, in learning the lessons that it needs to so that it can ultimately be victorious, that it can basically experience the cross. You know, the 144,000 at the end of the world who say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And I know it's a difficult thing to do, and, and pe some people don't really like it, where you take somebody like Manasseh, who's the wickedest king in Judah, and you say he's a type of Christ. Or Samson, somebody who's obviously has moral issues, but yet he becomes a type of Christ in his actions. So Delilah here, on the, on the moral surface is bad, but on the symbols, she's representing this movement in its predictions. And those predictions are of God. So, so we, we, we would have to take this whole story, because we know the, the ironic nature of Samson to Christ. So we would still have to take all of these things happening as not counterfeits, but as the genuine when we look at them as symbols. But these are tests that this message and the people yeah. in the message experience. What's, what's that, Rosa? Is there a message in the three times and then the fourth? Yes. Right. So that, that's a representation of the three one combination. And, and this we would and have. What to, does that yeah. mean? The three well, one combination. Okay, so what you have in a line. So when you go back to the story of Leviticus 26, for instance, you're going to have the four seven times. Now the first three are going to be fulfilled historically with Manasseh's captivity, uh, Daniel's captivity, and uh, uh, Jehoiachin's captivity. And then you're going to have the fourth, which is Zedekiah's captivity, and in those events, you're going to have the kingship that is struck. You're going to have the, the captivity, wild beasts rob you of your children. And then you're going to have, have um, uh, the sanctuary and uh, the women who, 10 women who break, bake the bread in one oven, all these different symbols of, of the famine. But in Zedekiah, the fourth, when, the, when that occurs, it contains all three. Now, the illustration of that would be the three angels' messages and the fourth message. So we can go to Millerite history. We can see the three angels' messages. And then we can see the fourth angels' message, which is the Sunday law, but is also our history. Now, in these lines, we had um, a progression or an understanding of the first, second, and third angels' messages within our movement itself. Right, so the first angel's message from 1989 to 9-11. 9-11 being also the empowerment of the first angel, but also the arrival of the second. And then this movement presently has been connected with the second angel's message um, ever since 9-11, right? So the second angel arrived, we're proclaiming this message, which is the coming Sunday law. But within that, we know that there is ultimately uh, a fourth and, and when I drew, drawn these lines out years ago, um, that fourth is going to be dealing with the time after the close of probation. That is, what's experienced in the first three angels' messages with the sealing of God's people and then the close of probation. You're going to have this fourth, which is going to be uh, related to the events at the end of the world. Um, I mean, I know I need to illustrate this, but... Um, you have a three, and then you have a one, which is always four. So when it comes to this message, we would have to define what those three tests are, whether it's November 9th, July 18th, and December 25th, 2021. But then we would also recognize what the fourth is. The fourth is going to be when Samson gets his locks cut off right of these these events i would agree and so that fourth must be some kind of completion of these three it's an illustration of our present movement now 
I'm leaning towards that these three tests represent November 9th, uh, July 18th, and December 25th, 2021. But the fourth is something future, which has to do with the character of Christ, because he's going to get his locks cut off. So whatever that symbol means. Um, and then he's going to have his eyes put out. Right? And then he's going to be put, basically, he's just going to be mocked. And uh, finally, he's going to take down these two pillars, the, the middle pillars of this temple of Dagon, right? That's coming up later, yeah. Right. So, so we, we have to take this as referring to Christ, but right as a negative symbol but also to this movement. And so we would have to try to understand what that means. I don't know if we have enough to understand what it means completely, but we should be able to know that that fourth is the victory, whether it's the victory of this movement itself or whether it's the victory at the end of the world of God's people, whether it's just the Sunday law victory or something more. Yeah, it sounds like we're binding up a message that's making it fruitless, and in the end, it's going to speak for itself. Well, see, don't look at the fruitless nature. Look at this binding up. Even though we have these negative symbols, they are positive, right? So the binding up is, you know, bind up the law and seal it among my disciples. So we can't take the negative aspects of this story and try to look at these things as negative. We have to look at them as their opposite, as their mirror. And, and that's where the confusion lies when we take this story and we try to, I mean, because the moral aspects are important because they're lessons to us right now. There's no doubt. But the symbols themselves that come from this story are illustrating this movement. Once we look at them in 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 their inversion, they are positive. Delilah does not represent something negative. She represents something positive. And, and what she's doing in testing Samson is something that God is doing to this movement, which can be perceived negatively on the one hand, I guess. You know, July 18th didn't happen. Our predictions weren't fulfilled. Those types of things. There's a disappointment that occurs with this movement. But ultimately, it was meant for God to correct us. That is, to prepare us for something. And so Samson represents the preparation of, of that message that's going to be a, demonstra a demonstration of the righteousness of Christ. Because this movement isn't just about numbers and symbols. It's about character. And Samson's a negative example of that. So that means if we take the negative and we turn it into a positive, it's illustrating something that is good. Okay. <clears throat> Symbolically. If Delilah is of the children of Israel, does she represent something within the movement that has been impacted by the world? No. She's, She's being something positive that God is giving to correct the movement. Explain. Well, every all the symbols attached to, to Delilah are positive symbols. Right? So she represents 144 times 144. Is this including the... 1100 pieces of silver that's a positive symbol right because that's the symbol of 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 islam 
right? It's also the symbol of the prophetic mirror. So the 6, 000, uh, 2,604 years of the prophetic mirror also symbolize the 26th day of the fourth month, right? So this is about the prediction. This is about the chronology. She represents the chronology that is testing this movement. The other thing is this 144 times 144. Um, this, this connects to the symbol of the 2520. So if in the 2520 prophetic mirror, I'm just going to share my screen here, if that's okay, so that we can... There you go. Um, right, so this is an old chart that I did quite a while ago. Um, there we go. So what you're seeing here is, um, this is when I was born, February 6, 1963. And if you take 144 times 144, you get this number 20,736. So Delilah's name, when you multiply it, is 10 times that. But it's still that symbol. Okay. And and you can see here I have raphia, the letters of raphia, R-A-P-H-I-A, and their numeric representations. Multiplied, they add up to that same number. Multiplied, the product is the same number. Now, from my birthday to November 15th, 2019, whoops, this is uh, 2,520 days from that date on the Mayan calendar in December 21st, 2012, where we start our um, uh, 777 chiastic structure. So now I, I met Heidi on that date. So on when this date happened, November 15th, uh, 2019, and that's going to be uh, basically the seventh day from November 9th, which Jeff talked about that week. On November 9th, he talked about that week that was uh, being marked from November 9th, which is a time of probation. But anyway, on November 15th, it happened to be uh, 25, 20 days from when I met Heidi on that December 21st, 2012 date. So the mine date is 130700. The 7 is 7 times 360 is 2520. So this is a complicated uh, chronological reference that we can see here. But what we would have to say is that um, uh, we can't ignore this symbol because these are symbols that have been testing this movement. And this movement uh, has to pass that test. So all through this, all through what's been happening, um, well, ever since I would guess 2000, 14, the test comes to this movement regarding chronology. Now, some people have just said, well, that was completely in error, right? That was the conclusion on the December 6, 2020 declaration. You know, we should never have gone in that direction. But we can see that God led in that direction, and we can see all the evidences of it. So we would have to take this message of July, Delilah as being this message of chronology that's testing this movement. So she she's morally a negative symbol, but the symbol when we apply it, the, the symbolic nature, so the, the moral, get rid of the moral, look at the others, it has to do with what God is doing in this movement. So Samson, in the end, is victorious, but in a very bad way in the story. I mean, technically, he kind of commits suicide. Um, but but when we look at that story in the, the numeric symbols that are given to it, we can see that this is representing elements of our movement, elements of our message. And that might be a hard thing for some people to take. But, I mean, we know that Samson's a type of Christ. So, I mean, that might be hard for people to take, too. But the symbols are very obvious. And then we have the two pillars that are taken down by Samson. So, if we're going to turn it on its head, wouldn't those two pillars be what's exalted and lifted up by Samson?
I think we're going to have to address that a little bit later when we come to that portion. Yeah. yeah. So, but yeah, so we're going to address that. But you, you see my point. The point is that you can't take, and, and it's hard to do because you're looking at this, all these negative things. You can see what, what Delilah is. And she represents that morally as a story, but symbolically, she's something good. So the application is being made, like you said yesterday, where Esther is being shown as something good, even though she was doing something that she shouldn't do. And the wife that preceded her <clears throat> that was doing something that that was seen as being something bad was actually doing something righteous when she refused to come before her husband and his drunken friends. Yeah, and we know that this the issue that happened in 2015 when Jeff presented this, and I, I, I think it might have been like the spring convocation not the fall one, but because I, I wasn't at either of them, but I, I think that I heard the story later, um, is that there are many people who could not accept that Vashti was a negative symbol because she morally was good. And so they ended up leaving the camp meeting, a, a group of people over that issue. And, and of course they would say, well, Esther, you know, she's, marrying a pagan king, this is not something good. Um, so she can't be a good symbol. But but we have other examples of this, right? Of course, Manasseh, the other one, but, and, and there's others. So when we look at a line and we look at the symbols, we have the moral story, but we also have what the story means when you put it on a line. And if we put Delilah on a line, it must be illustrating this movement presently, and especially the areas of chronology that have been testing this movement. And, and all those symbols are the things that point to July 18th, um, which is the center of this. You know, I'm hoping that's helping people. I know I'm, I'm kind of stuck on this but um i just see the importance of it who are the philistines what do they represent well so are you talking about like, how are we going to take the Philistines in this story as far as the symbols being ta attached? So they're going to be offering, because they're negative, right? I mean, this is the Philistines. Yeah, are yeah. But and they're, they're going to be, her to but they're going to, they're going to be offering this 11,000 pieces of silver, each one of them, right? So we have the five foolish right, if we we're going to look at it in a moral sense. But because the symbol represents that, that is, uh, the divisors of 1100 are 2604, then those symbols are representing something that's being offered to this movement. Um, so the Philistines aren't representing something negative. I mean, they could be representing, uh, you know, the Holy Spirit or the wise virgins or something like that so they're not a negative symbol once we put it once we turn it on its head they have to represent something positive not something bad only in the moral story are they something negative and and, and the way that i look at this of course is not just that the product or the divisors of um, 1100 are 2604, which is really interesting, but also the number 11 itself, which which I believe 
represents the message of Daniel 11, especially when we consider the other 11. And we consider all the times that 11 have shown showed up in this movement. Um, and, and, you know, my birth date is on the biblical calendar of the 11th day of the 11th month. So we have there a symbol uh, as well that relates to uh, the, the chronology. So Daniel 11, 11, there's lots of other 11s, dividing things into 11 years and 11 years, or 11 generations and 11 generations. We have uh, Zedekiah. Yeah. Being 11 years as well, and he, like Samson, was uh, blinded. Yes, exactly. Uh -huh. That was the other one that I'd mentioned yesterday. Because um, you both have uh, Jehoiakim and Zedekiah that both reigned for 11 years. So you have the double 11s there near the end um, with the three months. Uh, each of them have a three months attached to it, which I haven't, haven't quite decided what that meant. But yeah, he's also blinded just like Samson is. And then um, in prophesying the end of Zedekiah's reign when Babylon take Jerusalem, mm -hmm. Ezekiel, he um, shaves his hair. And so that could connect to uh, Samson then, having his head sheared. Okay. And we haven't really understood what, what this hair shearing means yet, what it means that his head is shaved and the seven locks are cut off. But, I mean, we would know they're the symbol of the 2520. Would it be something taking away the strength of the message? Well, no, but this is actually the opposite. So instead of taking away the strength, it's the strengthening of the message. That would be an empowerment. So everything that we see in the story that's negative, we have to switch it to its opposite. Does, does that make sense to people? Well, it's like a like a chi chiasm. We're seeing things things in the mirror. They're opposite. Right. It's a mirror. That's that's the way that we would look at this. It, it's it's the opposite. So, and and that's difficult sometimes to do mentally to take this negative story and then flip everything on its head, or to look at it in a mirror. But that's what we have to do with this story based upon the symbols that are there. Because our other option would be to say, uh, all these symbols of our message are now being shown to be false because they're they're a deception. We would have to say that Delilah is a deceiver, and you know all these symbols of this movement are now seen in this story of Samson, and so that would show that we were in error, and people could interpret it that way if they chose to. But of course, that would be kind of ironic that you're going to use the very method um, that we've used to come to our conclusions as an attack against us, but you don't believe in that method, right? I mean, that's always the problem I've had with uh, uh, some of the applications that have been made that have tried to use chronology to show that our chronology is wrong. That is, they're using the same arguments or the same methods um, to show that we're in error. And, and you can't really do that. That God couldn't, you know, show us July 18th is wrong, that it's a failed prediction um, using a method that's wrong. It, it wouldn't make sense. Uh, I hope that's helpful. I mean, it's, it's, am I talking too much, I'm trying to explain it too much, or do people understand it?
this is the concept. <laughs> Go ahead, Angela. Oh, I just said God's thoughts are not our thoughts. This is a concept that is going to take some time to understand. I mean, <clears throat> choosing to consider something that is morally wrong as being a, a proper symbol is a is kind of a foreign concept to a lot of people and when we first were addressing this with zedekiah and manasseh it was something that took some struggle to to really come to understand So there's a bit here that I think we're going to have to wrestle with on our own to be able to fully make sense of it. So we're going to have to apply some things and we're going to have to consider this very directly. Now we have about four minutes remaining in today's session. Do we have any other thoughts or comments? So just uh, so just one other thing. Just so this idea that there's this parallel between Samson and Jesus isn't something unique to this movement or Adventism or anything, um, because there are things that other people have noticed. Um, so, you know, if we can recognize that Samson and Jesus have parallels, and but Samson is a negative example of Christ, illustrating him, we shouldn't have problems taking this story and relating it to this movement. It just takes a little bit of um it's difficult for our mind to do yeah because both were born miraculously both were had births were announced by angels both came to deliver their people the holy spirit resided in them um you know both have the nazarite um name attached to them both spoke things in riddles both betrayed by a loved one both deaths defeated their enemies so so there's there's just lots that other people have noticed and and this has been for a long time it's not something recent no it's just that it, it's the symbols mm -hmm. that i think that we're all going to have to wrestle with a little bit yeah it sounds like the message is right at in the end. Mm -hmm. So if you take the right in the end and make a mirror, then you're making a, a negative. <laughs> I don't well, know. Well, it's, but remember, he's committing suicide, right? So, I mean, it's right in the end, but it's not right in the right way, if that makes sense. I mean... To me, he's not committing suicide because it's the message, right? The right. Message, the message is ending. That's the end mm -hmm. of the message. But morally, he's committing suicide. It doesn't matter that he's killing 3,000 other uh, Philistines, right? It doesn't say 3,000. Um, well, there's 3,000 on the roof. Oh, I'll be That's asking. taken down. Okay. If you if you say that, that would be like saying um, someone going to war is committing suicide. Well, yeah, I understand what you're saying. 
but he's going to be taking his own life. I mean, he's like a suicide bomber in that sense, right? Or a kamikaze. Because normally a person goes to war doesn't want to die. He's not going to choose to die. But, but he is illustrating Christ here. And there's also, you know, we're going to see when we look at this next week, uh, the different symbols. So he's going to take down these two middle pillars. But those two middle, middle pillars aren't representing something negative that's being torn down. It's something that's going to be held up. But, but this is well understood that Samson represents or parallels Christ, but in a negative sense. But, I mean, Jesus dies, right? So, I mean, people could say he committed suicide too in that sense. But he yielded up his life willingly for us. Anyway, our time is up. Okay. So, shall we now close with prayer? Loving Father in heaven, there are many parts of this study on which we need to apply ourselves. We ask, Father, for your guidance, for your direction, and for your blessing as we consider these points so that we may come to better understand them. Help us to understand these symbols. Direct us in the path that you would have us to follow. Be with us today in all that you would have done. May your character be shown to all of those with whom we come in contact. So that this will be to your glory and not to ours. For this we thank you and for this we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen.